<clears throat> you know, it's, it's pretty easy, isn't it, to love people who love you. Wouldn't you agree with that? It's easy to love people who love you. Matter of fact, it takes kind of a crusty individual not to love someone that actively works to love them. I think those statements are kind of true. And when you go to the old law, God stipulated through Moses that we were to love our neighbors, that his people were to love their neighbors even as they love themselves. But Jesus took it a step further and what Jesus did when he came along, he told his disciples, I want you to love one another the way that I've loved you. It's a new commandment I'm giving to you. Love one another the way I have loved you. And then the Apostle Paul comes along, and in a letter that he writes to the church at Ephesus, he kind of adds something else to it. Men, those of you that are husbands, he has something specific to say about the way you and I love our wives. Because over there in chapter 5 and verse 25, he says that we are to love our wives in the same way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then when you go down to verse 27, Paul carries it just a little bit further and he says this. He says that the husband who loves his own wife loves himself. So men, how well do you love your wives? Because how well you love your wives is a reflection on how much you love you. But for those of us who are Christians here this morning, loving our brothers and our sisters in Christ, even as we love ourselves and as Christ loves us, seems doable, doesn't it? And then loving our wives who already love us, to love them as Christ loved the church, that, that's doable, isn't it, men? We could say, I, I can do that. But if you look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount over in Matthew chapter 5 and you look at 5 through 7 and you look at His Sermon on the Plain which part of it was just read for us here this morning Jesus gives a command. It's not I want you to do this. It would be nice if you do this. He gives us a command about loving. And here's what He says. Love your enemies. And he doesn't just say it in what we're looking at here this morning one time. He says it twice. He wants to get his point across. Love your enemies. I don't know about you, but I find that sometimes hard to do. And then if that isn't enough, he even adds some things to it. He kind of fleshes it out because he tells us that this unconditional love has certain defining actions to it. And at first he just says... Do good, bless, pray. I can work at doing good. I can work at blessing people. I can work at praying. But then when you look at what he says, the people he says we are to do good to, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you or abuse you. So we've got love our enemies, and then those three added in with it. Does it not seem like that is very difficult to do? And I am here to tell you the truth of what Jesus is doing is He's calling us to be different from anyone else that we are going to encounter in the world outside of Christians. As a matter of fact, what Jesus calls us to do in these few verses that were read for you this morning is to be a people of distinction. We're to stand out from the ground. We are to be different. And it is seen in the way that we treat others. But I have to tell you before we go any further in this lesson, as I have worked through this lesson and tried to put it together, I have, and I am preaching to me as much as I'm preaching to anyone this morning. Because I don't measure up. I find myself falling short more times than I care to count of the standard that Jesus sets for us to try to live in a way that fulfills these commands is not always easy. It's not easy to love your enemies. It's not easy to do good to people who hate you. It's not easy to bless someone that is cursing you. It is not easy to pray for somebody that is in the process of mistreating you. And yet that's what we are called to do. 
And so what I want to do is to work through what Jesus has said for us to do and, and look at our lives because were it not for the abundant mercy and grace of God, I would not have a hope. But He is with us and it's because of what He does within us through His Holy Spirit that we're able to fulfill these commands that He sets before us. So let's look at this new radical love that Jesus gives us. He says, love your enemies. We've already touched on that. And when he uses this concept of loving enemies, when he commands us, he's speaking of a specific kind of love. It's not, and there were four words for love in the, in the Greek language, it's not what we call the storge love. It's the type of love that family members have for one another. It's not the love that we think of when we think of Brotherly love, the love that friends have for one another, phileo. It is not the love that a husband and wife will have for one another, that romantic love that's often referred to as eros. It is the love that is referred to so often as agape. And it is a love that is the result of a conscious decision that we make upon our part to seek the good, the highest good of another person, regardless of whether or not that person ever repays that love or ever says thank you for what we've done, we still love. It is a love that says, I will love this person by God's grace because I choose to love this person. It's not a love that you fall out of and fall into. It is a conscious love. And you know we have no better example of someone who did this than Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, and I put these scriptures up here before you, I want you to notice the words that I have underlined in verse 6, in verse 8, and in verse 10. Because here's what Jesus did for us. Notice what Paul says. While we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. We were the ungodly. Then, if you'll notice in verse 8, God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we were the ungodly, we were sinners. And then verse 10, He fleshes it out even more. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So there you have it. He tells us that we are ungodly, we were sinners, and not only that, we were enemies of God. But what did Jesus do? He laid down His life for His enemies, for the ungodly, for the ones that Paul would later call sinners. That's what all of us are prior to Christ coming in our life, and we still struggle with it, but we have forgiveness so did he love his enemies? Yes. But the question for us this morning is not did Christ love his enemies, it's do we love ours? Is it evident to those around us that literally are seeking not our good, but less than our good, that we are seeking their highest good? Do they know that we care about them, regardless of whether they care about us or not? But he doesn't stop there. He said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. <laughs> when Jesus told them initially to love your enemies. He wasn't saying, you know, it's enough just to refrain from doing somebody personal harm. You, you know, you, just, you don't go out and punch them in the face. Well, that's okay. You may not like them. You may actually hate them yourself. He didn't say that's okay. When he said love your enemies, he carried a step further and he said, you do good for those who are your enemies. You do good for the people who hate you. So it, a passive attitude of, well, I'm just not going to do them any harm. I may not want to do anything for them, but I'm not going to hurt them. Jesus said, that's not acceptable. That's not enough. You still have to go further. You have to do good to that person that hates you, even to the point of showing kind affection, goodwill toward that individual. So the question for us again comes back, how well are we doing at this? Are there people that you would say, they hate me? And if they hate you and they're doing things to indicate that they hate you, how do you respond to that? You say, okay, I'll just avoid them. I'm not going to hurt them, but I'm not going to have anything to do with them. Jesus says, no, you've got to engage in their lives and you've got to do good. And then he adds another thing to it. Not only does he tell us that we need to do good to those who hate us, he says that we need to bless those who 
curse us. You know, as Christians, our love finds expression oftentimes in the words we speak. Doesn't it? The things that we say to other people indicates whether we care about them or we don't care about them. Whether we really want what's best for them or not. And, and I know that there are those out there in the world that will curse us simply because of our faith in Christ and because we're trying to live lives in obedience to Him. And yet, instead of cursing them in return because they have cursed us, what Jesus says is that you have to bless them. Have you ever wished good upon somebody that is speaking bad of you? It's not what they would expect from you, is it? They would rather think that you're going to return the cursing. You're going to respond in kind to what they've said to you. You know, it's like the trash talking that takes place in an athletic event, maybe on a football field or a basketball court or somewhere like that. And one, one opponent trash talks another team member or a team member from another team. And the whole purpose of that is to get into that person's head to keep them from performing at their best. But what about if instead of the trash talking, the person who's the Christian on the team says, I understand what you're saying to me. I hope you play your best game tonight. I hope you do well. Or that was a great tackle. Man, I'm sorry. I had to see you coming. Or that was a good shot. You, you really faked me out on that one. I hope you do well in this game. I prayed for all of you, all of your team members to do well in this game tonight. You see, that's what it means to bless those who curse you. And isn't that exactly what Jesus did and what Paul and Peter remembered him as having done because they taught it themselves. As a matter of fact, if you go over to Paul's letter to the Romans there in Romans chapter 12, verse 14, here's what Paul says. He says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, in speaking about himself and the other apostles, he said, when we, re when we are reviled, we bless. We don't curse those who revile us, we bless them. And then Peter puts it this way over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where he says, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. That sets the bar pretty high, folks. Because it is so easy. It is the natural inclination within us is to want to do something, say something that gets back at that individual that, that hurts them as bad as they have hurt us. But Jesus says, that's not the way my people respond. And then there's that last one. He says, pray for those who, New American Standard says, mistreat you. The version, I think it's New King James, that George read from just a moment, says, who abuse you. Pray for them. You know, the Apostle Paul once said, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, he said, pray without ceasing. As I thought about that in preparation for this lesson, I thought, I think I know why Paul wrote those words. If you look at Paul's life, especially if you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you look at all of the abuse that was heaped upon him because of the preaching of the gospel in the different places that he went, Paul was a man of prayer. And he was praying for all of these places where he was going and for the people that were abusing him and for the people that were trying to shut him up, we might say, or to keep him from continuing to proclaim the gospel. He was living that out in his own life. And so he was saying to other Christians who were also suffering persecution, pray, don't stop praying. But perhaps the two best examples we have of that are none other than our Lord himself and Stephen. If you look at Jesus as he's been nailed to the cross, what you find there in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, and we've often heard this quoted, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. 
He's praying for those who are nailing him to the cross. Or Stephen, if you look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 60, as he's being stoned to death, what does he pray? Father, lay not this sin to their charge. He's praying for those who are throwing the rocks. Could you do that? Could you pray for those people? Could you as mothers pray for somebody that is hurting your child? Or hurting someone you love? Can we pray for somebody that is physically hurting us? Jesus said that's what we're to do. That's what we are to do. That's what we are called to do. Pray for those who mistreat us. As Christians, we're going to be mistreated. We're promised that. That all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And there are, it is during these times that we need to devote ourselves to prayer because of those. Our actions, folks, must seek the ultimate salvation of others around us. That's why Jesus says, he uses these illustrations beginning in verse 29 and going through verse 30. Notice what he says, whoever hits you or strikes you on the cheek, he says, offer to him the other also. Now what he was talking about there was when you're trying to do what's right, you're trying to share the gospel or you're trying to reach someone and just out of contempt for what you believe or what you're saying, they slap you. He says, take it. Offer the other one. Because your goal is to win that person. But now, I will share this with you. When Jesus was standing trial there before the high priest, and the high priest asked him a question, and he responded to the question with, you know what I've done, nothing has been done in secret. And one of the soldiers slapped him. What did Jesus do? Did he turn the other cheek? No. On that occasion, he said to that man, he reprimanded that man because if I've done wrong, testify to the wrong. The reason he was being slapped was not out of contempt or somebody that was angry with what he was doing, what well, they were, but not in the sense that he's talking about for us. So Jesus stood up to that. He rebuked the soldier for a wrongful action. But offering the other cheek is what we do when we're trying to reach somebody and they become angry with us because we're trying to do good or, or they don't approve of what we're saying, even though we're saying it in love. Not only does he say that, he tells us that we're to give not only our coat, but our shirt as well. He puts it this way in verse 29. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either around the world. Folks, there have been Christians who've had their homes and, and sometimes even their lives taken care of, taken away from them because they're proclaiming a message of salvation to those who do not want to hear that message. And still, those Christians continue to show love in spite of the mistreatment, in spite of what's being done to them. And that's what we're called to do to respond with an attitude that says, I still care about you regardless of what you've done. He says, give to the beggar. As he puts it here in verse 30, give to everyone who asks of you. Folks, love for our possessions should never keep us from doing for others, from giving to others and for their needs. We must be ready to give everything if the need arises to help others out. And I appreciate so much the, the way that this congregation steps up and gives time and again when our elders say, we have this need, we have that need, and you say, you give. But even on an individual basis, I know there's so many of you that give, and no, none of us ever know the extent to which you've given to others and what you've done for others. There will be times when love says it's not in the best interest to give to that individual because that individual will not use it for, the, for good purposes. And then it has to be withheld. But when it is needed, yes, we must give. And then he says, don't demand back what's taken from you. The idea of the way he puts it is whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Down through the ages, as I've already said, Christians have had their property taken from them and even their lives taken from them. Even to this very day, there are places around the world where that is happening. And these Christians accept the forfeiture of their property. Peter even talked about, and so did the writer of the Hebrews, to the Hebrews, about property that had been forfeited for the cause of Christ. 
And that's what Jesus calls us to do. But the main thing that Jesus is saying is that this type of love, it's radical because it's different from what the world practices. As a matter of fact, he uses what we typically call the golden rule. The New American Standard puts it this way, treat others the way you want them to treat you. Not, and notice what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say treat others the way they treat you. Because that's the world's way of doing it. I will treat you the way you treat me. If you are kind to me, I'm going to be kind to you. However, if you are, are a person, if you mistreat me, I'm going to get even. That's the wor- way the world thinks. That's the way the world works. You ca- you're kind to me? Oh, I'll be kind to you. You mistreat me? I'll mistreat you. But Jesus says, no. If you're going to be mine, if you're going to wear my name, if you're going to follow me, then you treat others the way you want them to treat you. You want them to be kind? You be kind, whether they're kind or not. You want them to treat you fairly? You treat them fairly, whether they ever treat you fairly or not. You respond always in the way you would want somebody to respond to you if you were on the receiving end. And he tells us why that's so important. It is because we receive no credit in this world for loving in the way that the world loves. And he uses three illustrations. Look at what he says. If you love those who love you, what credit is that? For he says, even sinners love those who love them. It's easy to love somebody that loves you. If you love other people that are already loving you, that's no problem. He says, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit do you have? What's the benefit in that? What makes you different from anybody else? Because sinners do the same thing. Or if you lend from somebody expecting something in return, What credit is that? For there again, even sinners lend to sinners expecting to receive back the same amount. You know, how often have you heard somebody say, I'm just as good as my neighbor. I'm just as good as they are. Well, what Jesus is saying is not, are you as good as your neighbor? Jesus is asking, how much better are you than your neighbor? If you're just like your neighbor, now if your neighbor's a Christian, that's good. But if you're just like your neighbor, if you're living in the same way, if you're loving because they love you, if you're doing good because they do good to you, if you're lending to them but you're expecting something back, you're just, you're, you're just like everyone else. It's not our neighbor, he says, with whom we compare ourselves. It is God that we compare ourselves to. So there is no credit given. You're not doing anything different from what anybody else outside in the world would do, Jesus is saying. No, if you're going to be my followers, you have got to stop comparing yourself to everybody else and start comparing yourself to God. What does God do? And here's what he says. If you will behave like God, then you will receive eternal credit for loving in the way Christ loves. Here's the way he puts it. Love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return. And notice he tells us two things. Number one, he says, your reward will be great. Love for others and for God has its reward. The reward is God himself. It is time with God. It is eternity with God. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, there Paul says something. He says, we, talking about the church, we, he says, are the temple of the living God. And then he adds something to it. He actually is quoting words that God spoke through his prophet or to his people through Moses long ago. It's found back in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 12. And here's what God said. He says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. So what is it? Our reward reward is great. 
What is that reward? God is going to walk among us. He's going to be our God and we are going to be his people. And one other thing, something else I might add. Romans chapter 2 verse 7. Paul there makes a statement. He talks about those of us who, as he puts it, by perseverance in doing good. Are you persevering in doing good? Because that's what we are to do as Christians. He said, those who by perseverance in doing good seek, as he calls it, glory and honor and immortality. He says, our reward, it's eternal life. Eternal life. But he takes it a step beyond. Not only is our reward great, but notice the second thing he says. This is what's really important. Because he says, you will be sons of the Most High. You'll be sons of God, sons and daughters of God. Why? Because you're living out a lifestyle that imitates God, that lives the way God would live and the way that God did live while He walked upon this planet. And notice what He says about God. He says, for He is kind. Notice to whom He's kind to to the ungrateful, and to the evil. Do you know anyone that's ungrateful? Do you know anyone that you would say they're evil? Did you see what Jesus just said about his Father? He's kind to those people. Remember what he said about him? He causes the rain to fall upon whom? The just and the unjust. God is one who is equally kind to the person who brings him joy and to the person who breaks his heart. Folks, this is beyond us. This is not what we normally do. You break my heart, I'm going to find some way to break yours. I'm going to find some way to get even with you. That's the way the world wants us to think. That's the way Satan says you need to act. They mistreated you. They deserve nothing good from you. But God says, no, that's not the way I treat people. I'm kind. I'm kind to those people who are ungrateful to me for all that I've done for them. Have you ever said that about something? Well, that ungrateful so-and-so, after all I've done for them, God's kind. They're just pure evil. I don't know anybody that's worse than they are. Jesus says God's kind to them too. And then he finishes it with this. He talks about how we are to treat. This is the love that we are to copy. He says be merciful for your father just as your father is merciful. Do you, do you know people that are as we've described them? Are you a person this morning who strives to be like God? Are you a person who is kind to those who are ungrateful to you, those who are just evil? Do we love our enemies? Do we do good to those who hate us? Do we bless those who curse us? Do we pray for those who mistreat us? If we are, if we're doing those things, then we are truly people of distinction because we are working to become like our Father and that's who we want to be like. But folks, if you're like everyone else this morning, I want to encourage you to change. And I say, as I said, I'm praying, I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to anybody in this room or outside these four walls. I want us to change, to be more Christ-like, to be the type of people that Jesus calls us to be in this sermon that he preached. And if only God can rescue you from the kingdom of darkness, as Paul said, and transfer you into the kingdom of his beloved son. And he will only do that if you are willing for him to do that. And if you're willing to come to him and seek your redemption and find your forgiveness in Christ, 
Because outside of that, there is no strength to live the life that we've been reading about here. There is no ability to truly do and forgive and, and, and be kind and pray and bless in the way that God wants us to do because that is from the strength that God provides within us. So this morning, if you're a Christian here today and you, as you've listened to these things, you say, it's not me. That is not me. I need to change my life. I need to do better. It may be that we need to pray with you and pray for you, and that's what we want to do if we can do that. But you may be a person here this morning that's not a Christian, and I want you to know that if you choose to follow Christ, the bar is set very high. God set it himself, but he will give you strength to live it out. Are you willing this morning to believe that his son is who he professed to be, Lord and Savior? the means to your salvation, the only way to God. Are you willing to confess that and then be buried with Him in baptism? If so, won't you come right now as together we stand and sing.